Welcome everybody, in this episode we are going to talk about the else clause for an if statement. This allows you to decide what happens if it evaluates to false. In our current code, the way we have it set up is if this evaluates to true, it'll execute this code, and then it ends. If it's false, it just ends. So we can't say something like, oh, well, thank you anyways, or come again soon, whatever it may be. Because if we just went down here and said, see out, let's go with something like maybe next time, goodbye. And we'll make the new line character. This is going to output no matter what. So when we run this, even if we say yes, it still says maybe next time, goodbye. So that's what the else clause is here to fix. Basically, we can say else, then we will want to output this. So we'll say else, another set of curly braces, and this time we're just going to surround this code and indent, which, quick note, the indentation is 100% totally optional, but it is highly recommended. This is basically a good way to format and structure your code, but the white space itself is not significant in C++, meaning this is completely valid code. Now obviously this is limited. There are certain things that if you do add spaces, it's going to mess up. So for example, you can't add a space here that's going to split the operator. Or if you add spaces inside of quotes, that's going to be interpreted as characters and change the output. But the indentation is still a good idea. But because it's not strict, it does introduce sometimes people writing things differently. For example, you might see if statements written like this which is more similar to what you do in JavaScript. No big deal inside of C++, but I've grown to do it this way. Or you might also see the else on its own line like so. Now let's try this out. If we say yes, then it'll output the true option. Let's play a game then. If we say anything other than yes, like bananas, it'll say maybe next time, goodbye. Notice how it just grabs that first character, B. Now, why not? Let's talk about another option, which is else if. This is how we can compare against some other value. Let's say they had to type in N exactly, or, you know, close to it, either no or capital N, similar to yes, but we don't just want them to be able to type whatever they want. If you wanted to do that scenario, just as an example, you would create another set of parentheses here and create another expression. In this case, we'll say to lower response, and we will compare that to the character n. When you define an else if, you can now have the option for no output if it doesn't fit either one of those. So do you want to play a game? We will say yes. That works. Let's play a game then. Let's try it again with n, and it says maybe next time, goodbye, and then finally we'll try something else like tacos, and it doesn't do anything. Now you might be wondering, what if you wanted that option of it's not yes, it's not no, can we say something custom for that? Well, yes, you will just have an else. So the else is the catch all. So now our structure is going to be if, else if, and then else. So we will go here and say else else. And just as an example, we could say, hmm, I don't understand. And now when we put in bogusness, is that a word, bogusness? I don't believe so, but bogusness, it just doesn't work. And we can also put the uh, new line. But the computer now is smart enough to understand that it does not understand that input. Do you understand? Now I do want to take another moment to thank our sponsor Embarcadera C++ Builder. Here are some of the features that come with this. The ability to create Windows and iOS applications in C++ with less code, with an award-winning visual designer so you can easily make GUI applications built-in debugging, which is something that you might not get with a basic text editor, and strong integration with databases such as these listed here. And it's free as the community edition. So you can get started today 
link down below. Now whenever you see repeating functionality, such as this two lower response, it should give you a thought in your mind of how can we extract this functionality into a single place. So in this scenario, it introduces a situation where you might forget to type one of these. Let's say you typed it like this. So if response is n, you know, you might take a look at this, oh, it seems right, but you forgot to type that part and now you have a bug because an uppercase Y works, but an uppercase N does not work. So that is why repeating code is generally frowned upon. It's very easy to make bugs and bugs are bad. So we never actually defined a bug, you probably understand just from the context of what I'm saying, but if your code compiles and it runs, but it does not work the way you expect it to work, that is a bug, also known as a logical error. Something is wrong with your code such that it compiles and runs, but it's not working the way you expect. So to fix this problem or this potential problem, we can remove this two lower altogether, like so, and move it up here. So what if we just said, hey, whatever this character is, let's just lowercase it right away. And we can do that by just passing in this function call to the two lower function call. So the nesting can be a bit confusing, but whenever you have nesting, it evaluates from the inside out. So this evaluates and returns that character, let's say it's Y, and then that Y is then passed into the outer two lower function call. That response is then assigned to this variable response. Then we can just use response directly. We don't have to worry about uppercase or lowercase because we already did that at the beginning. Now one downside to doing it this way is that you have some data loss. Let's say they inputted the uppercase Y and then we converted it to a lowercase Y. This is just a very simple example so it's not a big deal. But anytime we do some kind of data conversion, we might not be able to go back and get that original. So we might not know if they typed it in uppercase or lowercase. This could be pretty important if the person's typing in their name and you know their, their name might have certain capitalizations for you know fancy last names or whatever it might be. If we just uppercased or lowercased everything, we're going to lose that original data. So that's the only problem with this scenario. In the original one, we had the original response and we could always refer back to it. So if you wanted to protect the original data, you can just create another variable. So as an example, you could say the new one we are interested in is response filtered, whatever you might want to call it. So we basically clean up the data. We lowercase it, we remove any junk, and then that's where we invoke to lower passing in response. Now response, we're just going to keep it as the vanilla get char. So now we have both of these. This first one could be the uppercase Y, and this second one could be the lowercase Y and then you can choose which one you want to use. So we could compare response filtered and response filtered, but we could display the response. So what that means is we might be able to run this. Do you wanna play a game? Uppercase Y, and it says you entered uppercase Y, but the comparison still works for the lowercase Y because it's using that filtered variable. So that's just some more practice to increase your uh, coding chops. But this to me is kind of complicated because this is not a scenario where I feel saving the original data is that valuable. This is more just a uh, hypothetical example. So what I will do is just undo back to just having that single response. And to me, this is a lot cleaner and makes sense. So this is what I would recommend in this scenario. Now, as you start introducing more and more branching with if statements, things get more complex and there are more edge cases you need to test because now you can think about, you should probably test Y, N, and then something else. But you should also consider capital Y and lowercase Y, uppercase N, lowercase N, and then something else. So you can see it starts getting more and more complex. As you continue to create software, you will get introduced to the concept of test coverage. 
and basically what percentage of possibilities can we reasonably check to make sure they are working the way we expect. Some people will shoot for 100% test coverage. This can get pretty intense, so that might not be appropriate for all scenarios if there's like unlimited possibilities. But in this scenario, there's only like five or six main ways to use this code. So you can get pretty good test coverage just by manually entering a few different inputs. So just keep that in mind as you're designing your code, the least complex software is going to be the easiest to continue developing and the easiest to prevent future bugs. So always try to keep it simple if you can. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this video is helpful and stay tuned for the next one. Up next, we are going to talk about nested if statements, which are fun and can get a little crazy. So I'm excited. See you in the next one.